Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and gaze on the beauty of the Lord and seek Him in His temple. For in the day of trouble, He will keep me safe in His dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of His sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Good morning, and welcome to worship. We are here for this hour in God's place. We are here for this hour because although this God is everywhere, He calls us to gather as His people. He calls us to listen to His Word. He calls us to be refreshed and renewed in Him. He calls us to bring Him the cries of our hearts and to find in Him peace. So let's begin our worship as we sing, Bless the Lord, O my soul. So we pray. Lord, we be singing and reminded that we have received 10,000 blessings from you, and yet, so often like ungrateful children, we do not praise you. And we thank you as we come this morning, we come to you who embraces us, rich in love and slow to anger. And if we come this morning with pain, 
with worries, with concerns, with achings of the heart, we thank You that You come with Your rich love to hear us, to stand with us, to pour upon us the reassurance of Your gospel in Jesus Christ. And if we come this morning feeling broken because we know we have done wrong and we have failed and we have let you down and others down, then we come to you who are slow to anger. We come to a gospel of forgiveness. Your heart is kind. And so, Lord, we worship you less for what you have given us and more for who you are. Father, friend, and yet also Lord and King, controlling all things that we need have no fear in You. And so we come and we pray together that family prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be Your name. Your kingdom come, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I'm going to play a game. and The game is quite easy. Someone is going to have the name of Um, someone famous, Uh, I'll start off, and you're to guess who it is, but you've got to ask me questions, and I'm only allowed to answer yes or no. You played this game before? Uh, No, it's me to say yes, that's right, okay. So who's going to ask a question for me? I need to change the question because I'm only allowed to answer yes or no. Yes. Another question? A question? No. Not just now. No, we need more questions. Just keep them coming. No. No. Yes, very much so. Oh, I'm not going to say more than yes or no. Yeah. No. 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 Right. Someone that's alive, famous, male, not in the Bible. No, he's not a king. Yes. You want another question? Yes. Right, that's an easy one. Okay. Anyone else like a shot of being the person up front? Okay. You want to come and you want to come and have a shot? Right, I'll give you how about we give you oh not let people see it. How about I give you that one? Don't let anyone else see it. Okay? Right, yes, no questions? Are they famous? Yes, I think so. Yep, okay. Um, over here? Famous. We had famous, yes, famous. Let's try it. Is it a male? Yes, famous man. Is he alive? Yes, yes, yes. Is it Jesus? No. no. <laughs> Is it more than one person? No. no. Is he Scottish? No, no, I don't think so. Went to school in Scotland. Oh, sorry, that's a bit more information. <laughs> Is it the king? No. no. No, we need, we need more general questions, I think, to narrow this down. Jean, is he a politician? No. no. 
Is a sports star? No. Is he a poet? No. No? I think we're slightly on the wrong track here. There's a very basic question. Is that a royal person? No. No? Uh, is, he, is he someone that's sinned or done something wrong? Singer. I thought you said a sinner. Ah! Is he a singer? No. No. I think we need to give a little clue here because we're, we're on their own track. I think we might want to say it's someone in a book. All right, let's see if we get some more questions. Is it Harry Potter? Yes! <laughs> Right, thank you very much. Right, we've got time for well, at least one more. Someone else want a shot of asking questions, of being the person answering the questions? Um, who have we got? You want to come out? You both? You want to do it together? Or Iona, you're going to do it, are you? Right. Okay. Now, I'll give you someone. Let me just check that you definitely know who this is, because if you don't, I'll give it to someone else. No. Nope. What about that one? You don't think so. Maybe it's my writing. I've got a whole load of different ones here. So, oh, ah. Do you want to get someone to help you with it? Yeah. Would that be easier? Ruri, do you want to come and help? Would that be better if you did it together? <laughs> because it might be two people doing it. What about that one? Do you know who that is? No? Okay. What about that one? No? Okay. No. Marina, do you want to help them with one of these ones? I think that, because I, I think, I think you will know who these ones are. What about that one? Okay. Yeah, you can help them with that one. Okay, right. You need to, yes, no questions, right? Um, is, is the person female? Yes, okay. Are they a singer? No. Are they famous? Yes, fairly famous. Yep. Okay. Is it a sports person? No, not a singer, not a sports person. A uh, famous and I think we got female, didn't we? Yes. Scottish? No. Any other questions? I'm getting to the same folk all the time. Anyone else got a question? You got one there? No, just yawning, that's all right. Uh, any other questions? Are they Welsh? No, nope, don't think so. An actress? No, I think we had a no to that one. Is she young? Is she young? Yes, yes. Is she alive? Is she alive? Very much so. Young, female, alive, famous, not sports, not singer. Is she a climate change activist? Right, you want a follow-up question? Greta Thunberg. Very well done. Very well done. Right, okay. I think, I think that might be us just now. You can hold on to that one because it's taking a bit longer than I thought. Right, I've got one last one. And I'm going to do this one myself, okay, because I might struggle. So, right, questions. Is it male? Yes, he's male. No, it's not Jesus. That was so obvious where the children's address goes, isn't it? Don't know what the answer is, but it must be Jesus. Right, okay, any other questions? No, he's not alive. Is he a poet? No. No. Not Isaiah. Yes, it's someone in the Bible. Right? Okay, a male in the Bible. It's not Jesus and it's not Isaiah. That's as far as we've got. Not a poet. Is one of the... Not one of the 12 disciples. No. No, not Moses. A prophet. Yes. Ah, I did, Mr. Weir got it, yes. John the Baptist. Right, it's a good game, isn't it? 
you can try that one at home. Just think of someone to get people to ask yes, no questions until you get it in the end. You know, one day, Jesus said to his disciples, who am I? Now, he might have just said, like Colin did there, it's your Jesus, and that's the answer. But he was asking a deeper question about who he was. Who do you think I am? And they said, you know, some folk think you're like John the Baptist or one of the prophets or like Isaiah or maybe like Moses or, or somebody really fantastic that God sent. But then Jesus said to them, who do you think that I am? You know, that's a really important question. I could have gone through the list, actually. I had some other names here, and I don't know whether you'd known them all, but I had George Clooney and Princess Anne and a few other famous people. And, you know, if we'd ask all the questions, some of us would have known a lot about their lives. Some of us have read books about them or biographies about them. But if I asked you, do you know Princess Anne or do you know Greta Thongberg? or do you know one of these people, you'd have had to say, no, I know lots about them, but I don't know them. And what Jesus was really asking his disciples is, look, you can learn lots of things about me, but who do you think that I am? And Peter answered the question. Does anyone know what Peter said? You know who I am? Yes, but Peter gave a full answer. He said, you are the Christ, you're God's son. And he didn't say that because he'd learned it in Sunday school or he learned it in a book or the minister had told him. He said that because he'd got to know Jesus. And as he got to know Jesus and loved Jesus and knew Jesus was his friend, he also understood that he was from God and that he was God's son. And that when he knew Jesus, he actually was getting to know God himself. You know, in church, we learn lots of stuff. We learn in Sunday school. We learn as we preach. It's great that we learn new things, and we learn lots of things about God, and we learn lots of things about Jesus. But actually, what we're here to do together is get to know the Lord Jesus, that we might not just know quiz questions about Him or, or let the boys' brigade are doing a Bible quiz and learn lots of things about the Bible, but come to know the Lord Jesus Himself. And that's why we're here in church. And see if you come into church or Sunday school with that openness to what is God going to teach me about him? How am I going to get to know him better and speak to him? Then it changes everything that we do. We're going to sing just now a song that, that speaks about that, it speaks about both what God has come to do in Jesus, but also that we are really glad that it is for us and it's in our life. So let's sing together. Lord, I lift your name on high. And there's even some actions as we...
their own teaching. Our thanks to, to the choir for that. I think next week we're going to do that all together uh, uh, and, and learn it. I was going to suggest we did it right now, but I'm I noting that the words on the screen aren't quite the same words, so we need to get that right for next week. But it's a lovely, bright song to start our service with uh, and bring our praise with. So thank you for that. Before we read God's Word, um, just a, a word about announcements. Everybody should have either got one of these at the door or be on the email list for it. Um, if you didn't get one, make sure you get one when you come in. But it, the better way to save paper and the environment um, is that we get it emailed to us. The danger with emails to us is, how many folk get this emailed? Quite a lot of folk. If your hand's not up in your own email, please do email in to the office and Helen will add you to the list for it. Uh, but my next question would be, how many folk actually read it when it comes in the in, in, inbox? Can I, oh, lots of folk do. Can I recommend that you do? We have divided it to the news section and the regular event so that if you know what regularly happens in the church, you can just read the first section. Um, but a couple of things just to highlight this week. One is a reminder that there's tea and coffee after church next door and just an encouragement to you to come through and spend some time chatting to one another. It's really good to do that. The other is this week, there is a particularly good opportunity on Tuesday and Thursday night in that there is a mini Bible school happening across the road in the Glow Center. Um, I know last year, Elaine, you went, um, but it's just fantastic to have that opportunity for Bible teaching right next door um, on, a ch on those two nights. And Charlie and Tanya were saying, if you just turn up, that'll be fine. So if you are available Tuesday or Thursday, go along and find out. I think we did email a leaflet about this. It gives you more information out. You'll find it on the Glow Center's website. But it's just next door. Why not go and push yourself and find out a little bit more and, and go along? It's, it's, I, think, I think school um, might uh, be over pushing. It's, it, you don't need to be academic or trying to learn a whole load of stuff. It's just a good way to go and hear different folk speak about the Bible and some Christian teaching in the middle of that. So I give that a wee plug. But let's now read God's Word together, shall we? 
We're going to read to begin with from the Gospel of Matthew, and we're reading Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 25. It's a story we spoke about with the children as well. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or or, or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. And from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. And then we're going to read from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12, and reading the first eight verses. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace of God given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and those members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is in giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Amen. And thanks be to God for His Word. Let's pray. Father, as we come to Your Word just now, we ask that you would bless us to it to us, that as we hear it and meditate on it together, we might look to Jesus and hear and know Him. Amen. Jesus is an attractive figure. He's not only admired by Christians, but other religions admire him too as a great prophet. Even people who are um, atheists, his teaching impresses them. And as you begin to read the Gospels, there's those encounters he has with people. They are remarkable. He, and, and beyond that, just the way he pours himself out for what he believes and what he teaches. Even those that are not disciples 
are impressed by him. They called him John the Baptist, Elijah, one of the prophets, just a great person. Jesus, from the beginning, fascinated people. And then there's the church. And and let's be honest, the church's PR is not as good as Jesus's, is it? Frankly. There's different stories. But talk to anybody about the church, and very quickly, even if they're positive about it, the story will come to the stories of failure. From ancient stories about the violence of the Crusades, to modern stories that are in the news too often about abuse uncovered of a priest or a pastor or whatever has gone wrong. And we don't need those shocking stories of people that have fallen or abuse that's been uncovered because actually all of us have got our own stories to tell about things that have not been right in churches, don't we? That time when you needed and nobody called. That time when you came to church and instead of a welcome, you got a cold shoulder. That time when somebody was squabbling over something that didn't matter and words were spoken that were unkind and unhelpful. Neglect. Disappointment. Maybe even abuse. We've got the stories and we've all got the scars. And we are the ones that hung around. There's any number of other stories, aren't there, about people that didn't, that didn't come back because of what they experienced in churches. The church also talks about God. It talks about this God who who loves, and it talks about this God who, who gave Himself, and yet sometimes when we come to worship, it just doesn't really seem very real. The preaching, the lack of action. We look at the church and we think, you talk about this lovely Jesus, and you don't really reflect it. And sometimes, if we're honest, it's tempting to give up on church. Do you know what I'm talking about? I think every single person here does. Jesus and church. But then there's Peter. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about today. Peter looked at Jesus when he asked that question, who am I? And he said from his heart, Lord, you're it. I look at you and I just get it. You're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. And I love it. I want more of it. And Peter said that in a place called Caesarea Philippi. And that's quite significant because you don't need to know much about Caesarea Philippi, but it was a sort of holy place, a holy place for pagans. And in Caesarea Philippi, there's the ruins of an old temple to a Greek god called Pan. Uh, But there's also another ruin that is the reason it was called Caesarea Philippi, because a guy called Philip, who was one of the Herods, built a temple there to the dead emperor, Caesar Augustus, to honor him. That's why it's called Caesarea Philippi. So it was a place that honored dead gods like Pan and a dead emperor. And it was in that place that Peter said, not just you're the son of a God, but he said, you're the son of the living God. The son of the God that excites me. He wasn't just making a theological statement as if he said, well, I know God exists and I know that this is true theologically. Who cares about that stuff? He was saying, you make me know that God is alive. I see the life of the living God in you. I see God in you and it excites me. The world will be changed by you. Everything will happen because of you. I get it. And Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was revealed to you not by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And what Jesus is saying to Peter is, Peter, you've nailed it. 
But then he goes on to say, it wasn't revealed by flesh and blood, which basically means, says, Peter, you've got it, but don't get too ahead of the game because this wasn't because you were clever and you worked it out and you did the Bible quiz. This was because God is speaking to you and speaking through you. It's an important thing to remember as Christians. We're not followers of Jesus because we're clever and we worked it out when no one else did. We're followers of Jesus because God has spoken to us through him. It's all about God. But what Peter saw in Jesus was a revelation of the living God. Are you hungry for that? I know I am. Hungry not just to come to church or or to do things, but hungry to actually begin to look at Jesus and be excited about the living God active in the world. The living God come for you, giving meaning to your life. But then Jesus goes on to say something else to Peter that's very important. You are Peter. Petros is the Greek. It means the rock. And on this confession of who I am that you have made, on this rock, on this discovery of the living God incarnate in me, I'm going to build a church. I'm going to build a church. Now, this is very clear and very important. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who brought this life into the world, intended to build a church. And in fact, if you, if you read the Gospel of Matthew right through, the very last thing that Jesus said to his disciples at the end of Matthew's Gospel was, go out and make disciples, baptize them, and teach them that they can follow me too. He was intentionally saying, my life, the life of God in me, is about a legacy of teaching and of a message of building a church, and Peter, I'm putting it into your hands. I'm putting it into the hands of people like you who say that I am the Lord. This is yours. Now, why does this matter? It matters because in the midst of all we've said about the broken church and the beautiful Jesus, we need to understand that this beautiful Jesus is saying, you cannot dismiss the church because this beautiful Jesus is building a church, even when that church is not always beautiful. This beautiful Jesus is intending that his message, his gospel, his good news will spread through the world via this church, and it always has. Jesus did more than that because he went on to connect for Peter that what the church would do would connect with what God was doing. I give you, he said, the keys of the kingdom. What you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. How people react to you, Peter, and the message that you take out from me and the followers take out from me will have eternal heavenly consequences. If they accept you, they're accepting me. If they reject you, they're rejecting me. Now, I don't know about you, but that troubles me because it's putting an awesome responsibility on us, isn't it? That how we act and what we do and how we share this and how we live this will have eternal consequences for people. But Jesus also says that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, that's not because gates advance. It's because the church always advances and always overcomes. Now, what does this mean for us? It means this. You cannot follow Jesus and dump the church. And that's often very tempting. I I hear lots of people say, I, I, I just, I, I love Jesus. I, I'm going to follow him, but you know the church stuff. I've had so many bad experiences. I, it's so broken, I don't want to know. I give up. I stop caring about it. Or, or I go looking for the perfect one, and newsflash, you'll not find it. And, and any of you have moved around and gone to different churches, you can tell me what's wrong with every single one of them, can't you? The first thing that Jesus said to Peter back in chapter 4 was, follow me. And we know right away that he was telling other people to follow him, that they would follow him together. 
And the story of Jesus in the Gospels, the story of his teaching, the story of his love, the story of how he deals with people is intertwined in all four Gospels with the story of the disciples, that group of people and, and their failings and the things that they got wrong and the ways they hurt people and the things that they, that they, that they completely blew. You see, Jesus comes not as an abstraction that you can sort of believe in like a philosophy. He comes and embodies himself in people, in the church. But then he said to his disciples, don't tell anybody. You'll find this theme quite often of Jesus saying, hushed, right now, don't, don't say anything. The, the theologians call it the messianic secret. But what Jesus is really saying is, don't go about talking about the power of the living God in me until you understand something. Because there's something very important that I have to teach you just now. And he immediately goes on to begin to teach them that. Verse 21, it says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to the disciples that he would go to Jerusalem, that he would suffer, that he would be rejected by the people that matter and all of that before he was raised to life. And what was he saying as he said that? He's saying this, if you want to know the power of the living God released in the world, if you want a Messiah who's going to come and save you and, and bring the answers that the world needs, you need to understand that this God who is coming is the down and out God. This is the God who comes to give himself, to give his life in sacrifice, in brokenness, and to be killed. This is the way of rejection. You see, we want everything to be shiny, don't we? We want a church where we hang out with Jesus and when we come in, it's, it's, it's easy. We want great music. We want a successful church. We want people to be coming and, and, and things to be blooming and growing and getting stronger. We want to hang out with a Jesus who says, come and follow me and it'll be good. It'll be okay. It'll be healthy. It'll be full of peace and shalom and everybody getting on and things will be really, really good. And Jesus says, come and follow me because I come to be rejected and to pour out my life in self-giving. And he talks about the cross and we struggle 2,000 years on to understand the cross, really. I mean, we understand that this was horrible and painful, and we've all had the, the, the preachers who have told us how you suffocate and how long it takes and all the rest of it. But the thing that we miss 2,000 years on is what the cross symbolized in the ancient world, and it symbolized you were scum. You were nothing. You were stripped naked and hung out for everyone to see that you had been destroyed by Rome, that you were a slave or a rebel or a nothing and you could be spat upon, that you were canceled, that you were an unperson. Loser is what the cross said and what was it was designed to say. And God says only when you get that it is to be a loser in Jesus do you get the resurrection? The Roman world was a world that respected strength and success and achievement. And sometimes as we look at church, we feel the same. That's what we want. Success, respect, achievement, power. We want society to listen to us when we talk about moral values and shake up and, uh, and be reformed. We want to win the culture war so that we can, we can impose back our, our standards again. That's what we want. And the cross says the church is going to be marked out as the people who follow the eternal loser to victory. That's why that sign of the cross isn't a sign of a powerful church, but of degradation and embarrassment and failure. Peter hears all this, and he says, no. Never, Lord. Now, <laughs> there's a contradiction in terms, isn't there? You're supposed to say, Amen, Lord. Yes, Lord. I'll go with you, Lord. No, Lord, he says. And then he takes him aside 
and begins to rebuke him. Uh, here was Jesus teaching Peter the way that it should be, and now Peter says, no, no, you, know, you come and I'll tell you the way it's going to be. That's not how it works. That's not how it's going to happen. That's not what success is. Jesus has been explaining to him about suffering, and, and Peter says, no, 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 let me explain things to you. And unfortunately, in our world to do, that's what we often do. We say, God, this is how it should be. And God says, "Aha." Uh-huh. Now, Peter might have said to Jesus at that point, we're actually doing quite well, Jesus. Look at the crowds. You're popular. This could work. People are getting healed, and they, they love it. You know, you be a Messiah of strength. Come and sort things out in the world. Make life better. Bring peace and healing, not suffering. Popularity, not humiliation. Success, not failure. That's the sort of living God that I want to follow. I don't want to follow a God of failures. I want to follow a God who makes everybody feel good. And let's go with it. Build your church, Lord, yeah. I want great music, great community work, solid preaching, happy people, not so much of the humiliation, suffering, or costly failures. Yeah? Is that us? It's certainly me. What does Jesus say? Satan. Jesus calls Peter Satan. Well, that's not messing about, is it? You're not the rock that I want to stand on, Peter. You're the rock that I'm going to stumble on, Peter. This is human thinking and this is satanic. And what Jesus is doing here is he's calling out wrong thinking. And sometimes we say of these things, you know, I, I don't believe in a God who says hard things. I don't believe in a God who makes people uncomfortable. I don't believe in a God who calls things evil. Tough. Tough because if you believe in the living God, not the God that you made in your little idol shrine, then you've got a God, and that God gets to do the teaching. That God gets to tell you what reality is. That God gets to tell you what's right and what's wrong. You need to change, not him. Jesus goes on to say more than that. He goes on to say to Peter and the others, it's not just my suffering. But the cross is the pattern that as I pour myself out in love for the salvation of the world, if you want to follow me, you need to be reshaped by this pouring out because you are called to do it too. You know, our world at the moment, this is one of the reasons that people reject church because church is people together and our world is terribly individualistic. It's an I world. I don't mean iPhone, iPad, and iPod. I mean idolatry. I mean I choose, I decide, I find, I find myself, I go my own way. And Jesus said, I come and I give myself up. I pour myself out. And you must do that too. The power of the cross, the power of the cross is Him pouring Himself out, and we are asked to commit to that. And here's the other thing, Jesus commits Himself to the church. He pours Himself out, and He gives Himself to a, an institution that will sometimes be abusive and wrong-headed and sometimes quite lost because it is very human and broken, it's frustrating and it's disappointing. But what he's saying is, I pour out my love and my life into her that she might do the same as she follows me. The problem with giving up in the church is what we are often saying is, I deserve better than this. I deserve to be treated better than this. And Jesus says, so did I. And I poured myself out for them. And at the worst, that modern thing, and you'll have heard people say this, I don't need organized religion, I'm just spiritual. The problem with that is what he's actually saying is I don't need people because people fail. I don't need institutions and organizations of people, I just need me and God. 
And that is not what Jesus comes to do. The living God says, I will build my church. I will give my life for her. I will bleed for her. I will die for her. I will go to hell and back for her that I might present her in beauty to the Father and never give up on her. I will transform through her the world when she learns death and resurrection until she is blameless before my Father. In these days ahead, we continue to look at what what the shape of church is going to be like. And can I just say this? I am more and more convinced as I think about the gospel that ministry and being church together is not about looking for success. It's not about looking for numbers. It's not about looking for strength. It's not about looking for glitz or comfort. It's not even about looking to be the best in service. It's looking to find the God who poured Himself out for us and learning to follow Him and pour out our lives for Him. Are we willing to do that? For He did that for us. Amen. Let's sing, shall we? Sing these words if you can mean them, as broken as you are. I have decided to follow Jesus. As Eric was playing that before the service, uh, a few folks said it's just one of those songs you dance to, isn't it? Um, but um, let's go and dance to that. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we come and we worship and thank you for Jesus, our beautiful Savior. We thank you for the reassurance that he gives of his love. We thank you for the wisdom of his teaching. We thank you for the encounters that He has with people that remind us of the encounters that He has with us. We thank You for His pouring out for Himself in death. We thank You that He rose again. Victory over sin and death and hell defeated. We thank You for that promise that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. We thank You the Holy Spirit poured out on the church to empower her to share the good news with the world. And we thank you that over 2,000 years, that despite her failings and her frailty, you have enabled that gospel to grow. This is your work, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And today, Lord, we would come and we would pray. And the first thing that we would do, Lord, is we would confess as part of the church how we have failed you. 
we come before you and we cry out for every cold shoulder that we have given, for every time that we have been unwelcoming, for every time that we have countenanced injustice and turned a blind eye to abuse. We remember the sins of the pasts of your people, condoning slavery at times, sheltering grave injustices, not speaking out when things were wrong. But as we confess that before you, Lord, so we confess the week by week, day by day times where we neglect each other where we are half-hearted in our service, where we get so het up with the trivial things that matter to us and we forget the great love that you have given. But as we confess the sins of the church and of ourselves, so we thank you that our gospel is one that tells us that we are forgiven, but also tells us that you continue to pour out your Spirit on broken people, for those are the only people that you have ever called and ever used. And so, Lord, we ask your blessing today on your broken church. We pray for the church throughout the world, and we thank you that it grows in so many places today in strength. But we also thank you and pray for the places where the church is battered and broken, abused and failed. We pray for the Church of Scotland. We do not do that under any illusion that things are easy or any illusion that we've got things right, but we do that because you poured out your life for your church. And so we ask that you would guide us in our brokenness and help us to learn to trust you even in the difficulties of churches closing and numbers lowering, to see in you every encounter to see in you every person that through the church, as broken as she is, finds the living God. In the days ahead, we pray that you would bless the life of our church, that you would give us a culture that looks to your Word and then looks to each other, a culture where we might grow, a culture where we might love, a culture where we might start to think about this mission that you've given us, we pray for our youth organizations. We pray for the Sunday school upstairs. We pray for all the things that we'll meet during the week that are on that news sheet that reminds us, Lord, of all that we are doing. Bless us, we pray. And as we pray for ourselves, we pray for the other churches in Motherwell and particularly the other church of Scotland as we stumble our way forward in presbytery planning. Through the brokenness, Lord, we ask that your Spirit would move. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing now a song which reminds us about how God sees the church, even in all its brokenness. So, church, arise.
now go. Battered and bruised as you may be, but touched by the living God. Having received all the promises that He has made to us together. And church, may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be yours this day and forever.